everyone for coming to our discussion on the Affordable Care Act. It goes by many names. Just before we begin, let me explain a little bit about this event. It's part of our Constitution Day discussions that we plan on having semester after semester here. This particular event is the first of its kind, as far as I know, in which an assessment will be done outside of the classroom. So many of you here, including some of my students, are being assessed in citizenship, values, and ethics. You have those questions, I hope, and uh, you will be asked to respond in two pages or so, and it will count toward your grade and your respective courses. So I think this is really the, the, the basis of of what we're trying to do here to assess outside the classroom. I'd really like to thank Robin Knowles uh, for that. Oh, there you are. Uh, without her help, she's, for those of you who don't know Robin, she's a, an associate professor in dental hygiene, and she's also the chair of the Citizenship, Values, and Ethics Ability Group, has done a great job with that. She was instrumental in making this event happen. Okay, so the Affordable Care Act, what is it all about? There's a lot of controversy surrounding it, of course, and I think there's a big disconnect between what a lot of Americans know about the act or what they think they know about the act and what is actually in it. So this event is also an opportunity to shed light on some of the key dimensions of the Affordable Care Act. We know that the presenters will shed light on that. So let me introduce the panelists for you, and we'll launch right into the discussion. Dr. Ellen Andrews to my left. She is the executive director of the Connecticut Health Policy Project. It has been since 1999. She's held positions in consumer advocacy, policy analysis, and uh, she has directed healthcare services as well. Bernice Cullen is the executive director of the Yankee Institute for Public Policy, an editorial page columnist, and uh, I'm glad to have him here as well. And of course, many of you know Professor Bob Brown. He is a professor of history and journalism and comp, and about eight other courses, I think. Too numerous to mention here. Uh, before coming to Tungsis, he worked at the Bristol Press, the Harvard Current, numerous other newspapers. So those are the three panelists. I will be moderating, if you can call it that. I'll probably just step to the side and, and stay there for the remainder of the, of the session. But here's how we're going to work the whole thing. We're going to give each of the presenters 10 to 12 minutes to discuss. Professor Brown is going to talk about a bit of the history of, of healthcare, beginning at the start of the 20th century on to the present. Dr. Andrews will talk about uh, the benefits, some of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Ms. Cullen will talk about some of the maybe misgivings and, and uh, uh, downside of, of the Affordable Care Act. So they each have 10 minutes. At the end of each presentation, I may step in and ask a question or two just to get the discussion going and, and having it move forward. And after their presentations are done, that will give you the opportunity to ask your questions or have any comments that you'd like to share. Feel free to do that. So let us begin with uh, Professor Brown. Thank you. Um, a couple of announcements. I'll get the questions to my students, OK? Um, the other thing is my students in the US History 2 section that's meeting now, I have your exams in my office and you can come by after. That's about it. Um, healthcare first emerged as an issue of national debate in the United States at about the turn of the 20th century, a little more than 100 years ago, during the administration of President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, at the risk of insulting everyone in here and certainly the students in my US History 2 class, I'll take the time to explain, this is the Republican Roosevelt, whose nephew, the Democrat, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was president during the Great Depression of World War II. And I do this because it reminds us that politics and public affairs haven't always been the way they are today. Issues change, positions change, all the time. 
issues more with this. Theodore Roosevelt was president during what we call the progressive era in national politics. Progressivism was a broad political movement associated with both parties. It encompassed what today might be called both liberals and conservatives. Historians in the last several decades have grappled with what progressivism and the people who call themselves progressives actually believed what they embraced. The um, essential answer seems to be, as the historian Robert Levy has written, they were engaged in a search for order during a time when there was going to change in disorder in the United States. Old institutions seemed to be crumbling in the face of massive industrialization, immigration, population growth, and economic economy. Roosevelt's support for government-sponsored health insurance seems to be uh, sort of an extension of that sort of amorphous, uh, amorphous motivation. He simply believed that no country could be strong if its citizens were physically. In 1906, during the middle of his presidency, an organization called the American Association of Labor Legislation began a campaign for national health insurance. It proposed legislation that would provide limited government health insurance to members of the working class, which it defined fairly broadly, and others who earn less than $1,200 a year. Costs were to be shared by government, by the workers themselves, and their employers, a model that's somewhat similar to this. The legislation had the support of the American Medical Association. It's one of the things that's changed over time. It was opposed, however, by the dominant labor organization of time, the dominant <coughs> union organization of this time, the American Federation of Labor thought that such a system would weaken worker identification with unions. The government would supplant unions. Private insurers also opposed the legislation. Then, in the middle of the discussion, came our entry into World War I. The talk of social change in a variety of areas pretty much disintegrated under the pressure. Periodic efforts flared up here in the 1920s and 1930s to revive discussion of national health care insurance. Uh, they died out almost as quickly as they flared up. Ironically, perhaps, a National Health Act proposed in the late 1930s that would have essentially extended a national health care system uh, of undefined uh, magnitude and, and uh, direction uh, failed because it never received the full attention or support of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Democratic Roosevelt, whose uncle had been president uh, and an advocate of national health care. Growth of private health insurance systems, including those associated with large employers, pushed health insurance off the nation's political agenda in the post-World War II period in the 1950s. Opposition to any extension of national uh, health insurance uh, also stiffened when the American Medical Association, which had supported the earliest health care initiatives, came out in opposition to publicly financed health insurance on the ground that it was socialist medicine that could lead to socialism in other areas. The next major push for publicly financed health care came during the late 1950s and early 1960s. The legislative calls for legislation to cover hospital cost retirees. By the mid-1960s of the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, the Democrat, public financing for hospital, of hospital costs for the elderly had sort of broadened into a proposal for broad medical coverage for the elderly and the poor, Medicare and Medicaid. This was major legislation that put government into the health care business on a systematic level for the first time. It was very much a part of Johnson's vision of a great society in which poverty had virtually vanished. Efforts to extend Medicare and Medicaid to use them as a foundation for further national health insurance initiatives never materialized, at least in part because the turmoil of the 1960s, spawned by unrest at home and the unpopular Vietnam War abroad, called into question the entire notion of a great society without power. At this point, we get to flash forward for about a quarter of a century to the early 1990s, and a political upset that did revive health care as an issue in national politics. In Pennsylvania, an academic and attorney with the wonderfully academic name of Harris Llewellyn Wofford decided to run for Senate. Wofford had a government service career that stayed in the 1950s, under the Republican President Eisenhower and continued under the Democrats John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Wofford left public service in 1966 to become president of the State University of New York, Old Westbury, and then moved on to become president of Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania. Leaving Bryn Mawr in 1978, he spent the next seven years as an attorney in private practice before returning to governor, government as Pennsylvania's Secretary of Labor and why spend so much time on Harris, Llewellyn, Wofford? 
1991, he decided to run as a Democrat for the U.S. Senate seat in Pennsylvania that had opened up by the death of his previous occupant. The Republicans nominated Richard Thornburg, a well-known former governor of Pennsylvania who had been attorney general under both President Reagan and the first president Lewis. Wofford began so far behind in the polls that his campaign was written off by just about every political observer. Instead, he actually won by 10 percentage points, a fairly sizable victory. Uh, his issue, not issues were the economic recession of the time, for which Bush was saddled with the money, and the need to provide health insurance for the uninsured. Just as important as his victory were the two men chiefly responsible for creating Democratic political consultants, Paul Balaga and James Carville. James Carville, until then, had been a little-known Democratic political consultant and operative. Uh, Wofford's uh, victory sort of catapulted him into recognition um, in the top leadership of the Democratic Party. Wofford himself served until 1994, three years, when he was defeated by Congressman Rick Santorum, whose name has been uh, featured prominently in the news this, uh, this year. Um, of more importance at the moment, however, Begala and Carville took their services in 1992 to Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton, who was running his own long shot campaign for president. Carville, who became the key figure marshalling Clinton's successful life, brought with him the same two issues to Wofford's campaign, an economy in recession and health care insurance, in particular protection for the estimated 37 million Americans who had no health insurance at all, and for the nervous workers who would lose their insurance if they lost their jobs during the recession. Almost as soon as he took office, Clinton appointed a health care task force to be chaired by First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. His mission was to come up with a comprehensive plan for universal health care to assure coverage for all Americans. His first decision, perhaps fatal, was to decide to meet him private, away from prying public eyes. Ultimately, it produced a plan that had as its centerpiece a mandate for employers to provide health insurance for all of their employees through closely regulated health maintenance organizations. I say closely regulated, I mean by the government. But people important workers could not be disenrolled if they lost their job. The federal government would pay the cost of HMO membership for them. In all, the plan ran to more than 1,000 pages. Critics, both Republicans and Democrats, attacked it as ill-conceived, overly ambitious, and deceptive. It would, said the Conservative Heritage Foundation, impose a top-down system overseen by a national health board with the authority to establish endless rules and regulations. Buried in the plan were controversial provisions regarding such matters as minority recruitment by medical schools which allowed the critics to charge to argue that the task force had far exceeded its initial charge and had turned the health care plan into a document for social engineering. Ultimately, this plan died. Um, Democrats seeking to undo some of the damage done by the withering criticism of the uh, Clinton health care initiative uh, began to vote their own plans. There were two or three floating around. None of them could obtain majority support. Uh, one impartial observer pronounced perhaps the best appetite this was, he wrote, a referendum on big government. Hillary Clinton had launched a massive health care reform plan that wound up strangled in its own red tape. In the 1994 election that followed, the Republicans gained control of both the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate for the first time in 40 years. This was widely regarded as a referendum on the Clinton presidency and on its social policy ambitions. Parenthetically, I'd also say that this defeat led President Clinton and his people to back away from aggressive social programs such as this one. In fact, Bill Clinton, the governor who won the presidency in 1992 by pledging comprehensive health care reform, won re-election in 1996 as the president who, in his own words, destroyed welfare as we know it. Compounding the irony was the discussion that began among Republicans about possible alternatives to the flawed Clinton plan. One option advocated by some but all participants in the Republican discussion was a plan to require everyone simply to acquire health care, the so-called individual mandate. It was a Republican, <laughs> Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, who took up the individual mandate in the effort to establish the first true state health care plan in the nation. The Massachusetts law, passed in 2006, required virtually all people in Massachusetts to acquire at least minimal health insurance coverage. It provides free health care insurance for the working poor and subsidized insurance for families with slightly higher income. Between the mandate, the free and subsidized insurance, and Medicaid, nearly everyone would have health insurance. Employers and all but the smallest companies were required to contribute to the cost of employee premiums. That plan is still there today. 
Romney took quite a pounding during the Republican presidential debates because of his uh, efforts to get it passed in the law of Massachusetts. During 2008, in his own campaign presidency, Senator Barack Obama didn't put the same substantial emphasis on health insurance that Governor Clinton had done. He did talk about it, however, and when he talked about it, he seemed to be in favor of what we call a single-payer system, basically the government um, providing uh, health care uh, to health care support in, in many ways, and basically um, a single institution, the government, assuring the payment gets made on time. It's never, no, nobody's ever actually said, I have been a single-payer system in which only the government administers, but Obama came somewhat closer to that than others did during his campaign. Fairly early in his administration, he did put forth a major health care initiative that stopped short of single-payer, keeping employer-provided insurance in place, making it easier for people to shop for private insurance in a government-regulated exchange, expanding programs to help low-income people, and requiring large employers to offer insurance or contribute to a health care fund. After considerable debate, discussion, and compromise, as well as some slick political maneuvering by the Democrat, Obama to circumvent political roadblocks in the Senate, President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. It is a complex document that does not bear a great deal of similarity to what Obama talked about either during the campaign or in his initial plan. At the heart of it, however, is the individual mandate, the requirement that virtually all Americans obtain health care, health insurance. It's not single payer, and it's not the Clinton exercise of 1,225 pages. It has, however, drawn the opposition of a large group of states' attorney generals who filed suit challenging its constitutionality, and that's the case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court in March. The court set aside six hours of public argument spread out over three days, and that's an unprecedented amount of time for it to spend on a single issue. While the discussion ranged over all the elements of what we've come to call Obamacare, both sides embraced that label now. Substantial time was devoted to the individual mandate. The state attorneys general argued that the individual mandate violates misuse, it involves misuse and abuse of the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. This is the clause in Article 1 that gives Congress the power to regulate con uh, commerce between the states, commerce with other nations, and commerce with Indians. I'm going to take a minute here to oversimplify a complex body of arguments. I don't bear with me. I'll try briefly to summarize the arguments of the two sides, the essential arguments. Supporters of the legislation argue that this current system drives up the price of health care to an unsupportable level and that it promotes inefficiency in the delivery of health services. Hospitals, they point out by law, cannot refuse to treat the sick and injured. Those who cannot pay for expensive medical procedures, the supporters say, find their bills paid by others in the form of higher costs. One result is to drive up insurance for those who have insurance. Another is to assure that those without insurance only receive treatment when a condition which could have been treated in the doctor's office becomes critical and results in expensive visits to the emergency room, by which time, too, treatment may not be enough. Insurance companies operate across state lines, they say, and therefore insurance is subject to federal legislation and regulation. The heart of the argument for the opponents is, I think, that the Commerce Clause does not give Congress the authority to force individuals to do anything. An individual's decision not to buy insurance, the argument goes, cannot be construed as commerce because the individual only engages in commercial activity when he or she actually makes a purchase. In other words, the decision to purchase, not to purchase, is not an act of commerce and is therefore beyond regulation by Congress and legislation. Uh, during the uh, oral arguments on the case, I think uh, Justice Stanton and Scalia presented this argument most effectively. If the government can do this, people to do something that they might not choose to do otherwise, what can it not do? I think that's pretty much the, uh, the essence of both sides, and I'm sure my fellow uh, panelists will uh, uh, expand, elaborate, correct uh, in due time. Uh, the Supreme Court will hand down this decision in June. My best guess, given the current makeup of the Supreme Court, is that it will strike down the key provisions by a vote of 5 to 4. That's only a guess, and I'm not a good guesser. After all, I believe the first, I was convinced for the first six months of 2011, the Red Sox were going to win the World Series. <laughs> and I continue to believe that the Washington Redskins will win the next Super Bowl. <laughs> so, you know, don't go to the bank on my guess, but that's just sort of how I believe the way it will be. Thank you very much.
Professor Brown. I just have one question for you. I don't know if you uh, could answer it now. I'm sorry. I just uh, the question I have, and I've thought about this myself. I don't know the answer, but as an historian, I'd, I'd be curious to, to uh, uh, think what you think about it. Um, do you think the from the Great Society programs to the Affordable Care Act? Do you think that this has been more uh, a continuation of the 1960s, Medicare, Medicaid, or is this a departure? Well, that's a good question. Um, let me see, how would I approach this? Um, I do think that there was a period of time in the 1970s, 1980s, and um, 1990s, even until today, when we can, we can see, well, let's put it this way, uh, the um, nation's politics ever since 1980 has been defined by single man Ronald Reagan. We lived until 2008, I think, in the era of Reagan. Every political candidate um, that was not, not fashionable, not popular, might advocate a bigger role for government in the nation's life. And I think to that extent, what you have here in the 1990s Clinton's um, health care proposals is a resurgence of uh, an attitude that, yes, had its home in the 60s, I think. Uh, but I also think that the faith that it met and the changes in policy direction that Clinton undertook um, after the failure of his health care initiative point the in, to the enduring power of Reagan's belief in a smaller government. So I think to that extent, it is, it's, it's a new thing. Uh, I think that, it, you know, I, I do believe that, just sort of looking down the road a bit, I do believe that in time we will define the period after 1980 for an un unknown time in the future as the age of Obama. I do think that we have a breaking point in 2008. For 28 years, uh, Ronald Reagan's agenda defined national politics, and even before that, and remember, he was elected articulating a set of views and values, small government, his signal phrase, one that they got you. Um, applause lines in the 1980 campaign and he was running for governor of California in the 60s. He said the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That marks a sea change in attitudes that had been failed up to So we have lived in a conservative, I, I've lived all of my adult life in an era that is uh, profoundly conservative, and I think that explains why things like, like Clinton win. But that's the, that's the uh, social climate in which Clinton's plan failed and uh, and what was going to happen to Obamacare. Like I said, my best guess is key parts of it going to be struck down. So I guess the answer is yes and no. no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, that. Uh, I do think that, that yeah, they're, they're building on a certain tradition that, 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 that had once time been, one, once upon a time been a dominant tradition. But I think the initiatives themselves do reflect a different set of values from the environment in which they were developed. And I think that that does harm Thank you. Dr. Andrews. Yes, did I want to I brought some slides just because that's my crutch and I need them to explain all this. And then I realized that I wish I brought different slides than the ones you're going to say. These will be on the web. There's a lot on them because I never know how to. There's a lot in the bill and a lot more than just the individual mandate. And it's important for people to know that. That's one of my soapboxes. Is that people need to understand there's a lot in the bill. Sure. I'm Ellen Andrews. I'm from the Connecticut Health Policy Project. We're a nonprofit research and education organization. We do advocacy at the Capitol. We have a toll free assistance line. Um, your professor Klukas used to work with us. Um, we uh, and I've worked at the Capitol here in um, in Hartford. I've worked in a lot of nonprofits. I've done direct service work. Uh, that's probably more than you wanted. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, the slide that I wish I had shown were the reasons that um, the Affordable Care Act became important to do and the, the politics you've heard a lot about. But one of the issues around this is the economics. Healthcare now consumes about one out of every six dollars that runs through our economy, and that's going up. And that's far more, maybe double, most other industrialized countries. We're, and we're not getting for that what we're paying for. Our, our mortality, you may hear that America has the best healthcare in the world. That's true. We also have the worst health and it depends who's paying for it, how you access it. Being uninsured in Connecticut, you would think you'd have to do research on this, but honest to God, they've done research that it's not healthy to be uninsured. Um, 
um, it is not good for your health, and people who are uninsured are more likely to die. They die faster. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that led to this, that the status quo was costing us a lot of money, consuming more and more of our economy. We could do better. That's what the Affordable Care Act was meant to address. You can listen to it, decide whether you think it did or not. Um, I'm still deeply ambivalent, to be honest. Um, but anyway, so I will get to, this is now, I'm gonna show you the first slide. Don't get scared. Um, Marketplace. It's um, 
that I'm hoping it's not just this, but it's been described as sort of a travelocity for healthcare. You would have to go and read the fine print to be comparing apples to oranges to Cadillacs to, you know, potato chips. It would give you, you'd be able to make reasonable decisions. It's also where you would go if you're below 400% of the poverty level, which I wrote that down somewhere on into it. You can get subsidies to help make insurance more affordable. I don't know how many of you have tried to buy insurance, but it is not affordable for most people. Um, so this, this insurance exchange is really important. Unfortunately, because of the politics of the way the state, the, the bill was done, all the um, uh, responsibility for doing that has fallen to the state. And um, uh, that's not be my bias, but uh, we actually, I had to practically give up my firstborn in uh, the uh, bill creating it in Connecticut, but you're not supposed to have any affiliation with an insurer to be on the board of that exchange, because that exchange is gonna decide which health plans get in there, what they have to cover, what they can charge you, and, and who's gonna watch them to make sure they do all of that. Those are very important decisions to make sure that you're, if you're gonna be forced to buy something, that it's actually worth buying. There probably shouldn't be anybody from an insurance company on the board deciding that, right? Don't see, how come you all get this? Um, they put three people on <laughs> from insurance companies. Um, yeah, everybody's rolling their eyes, of course they do. Um, guess how many consumer representatives they put on there? Zero. <laughs> nobody, nobody. Um, anyway, not that, I, not that I feel strongly about it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's the exchange. Um, 140,000 people in the state will get federal subsidies um, based on income to purchase insurance. Um, Medicaid is going to go up 130,000 people, which if any of you have been on the Medicaid program and you know how troubled it is, that you should be, you know, hyperventilating right now. I do. Um, the state spending will go up under this, but actually because of the federal money that comes back to the state, we're going to spend a little less on, um, actually quite a bit less, 300 million less between 2011 and 2020 on health care in the state. And um, there's going to, but the state is going to have to be on top of things. They're going to have to make sure that all the rules that I'm going to talk about in the bill actually get enforced. That insurance companies can't charge you too much in administration. They can't deny you care, uh, deny you actually ever. Um, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. What it means to the uninsured. If you're uninsured right now, it means that you'll get affordable options. Um, the traps and the policy fine print. You know those things like oh, you know. We didn't mean that we were going to actually cover, you know, high blood pressure. Um, those things are not, um, those are, will be illegal. Um, there'll be subsidies for people with low income. There'll be a basic benefit package that they can't go below. So if you buy insurance, it should cover the things you expect insurance to cover. Um, a man, you will have a mandate, and the uninsured will have a mandate to either buy or get coverage if they're low enough income and they qualify for Medicaid. Um, there's a possible safety net capacity problem. Um, in Massachusetts, when they did pass um, national reform, or their reforms, it, um, just because you get a plastic card doesn't mean you automatically, it didn't grow doctors overnight, it didn't grow nurses overnight. So it could take, it took a year in Western Massachusetts to be able to get an appointment with a physician. So people are paying their premiums, but not getting anything for a while. So this, the bill does address that, not as much as I'd like, but it does. Um, more options for people for coverage, more leverage in purchasing, and you could become a market driver, actually. You won't be, through this exchange, you'll be pulled in with a whole, with another 100 and something thousand people, 400 thousand people, um, and you'll be purchasing together, so you'll have some power. And, um, but people are gonna have to change their behavior. They're not gonna be able to go to the ER first. You know, when you're sick, you actually should call, you should have a primary care provider, and you should call them when you have an infection, if you have, you don't go to the emergency room anymore it's going to cost you more. And many will um, uh, go into Medicaid. If you have insurance, they keep saying that um, it's not going to affect anything if you have insurance. Well, I hope it does. <laughs> because having insurance is not a blank check. It's not, you know, as easy and perfect as people think. Well, most of the people who end up in the emergency room and didn't need to breathe there had insurance of some sort. Um, so you'll have more options, reductions in rising costs, There'll be insurance reforms. I'm actually going to go through this a little bit. Did you know that um, this was happening in Connecticut uh, and everywhere, actually, in other states, that people would pay insurance for years and years, buy individual policies, and then as soon as they got sick, say you got you know, cancer, they'd say, oh, you know what? Way back when you filled out your application 10 years ago, you've been paying 10 years of premiums, you, you 
be shocked. When you and Joe always put the correct weight on an application, I clutch mine, I don't know about you. Um, well, they can use that as an excuse and say, you know what, you lied on your application, sorry, we're canceling your policy. Just when you happen to need it. That's no longer legal. You wouldn't have thought that should be legal ever, but it now long, no longer legal. 26-year-olds, uh, kids can stay on their parents' policies, um, they, they can't put caps, lifetime caps of say a million dollars or, or annual caps on um, of say, you know, $10,000 or $100,000. That sounds like a lot of money. You can go through that really quick in the hospital. Um, guaranteed issue. They can't say no to you. If you want insurance and you apply for it, you have to, they'll have to give it to you. They can't say no, sorry, you have a pre-existing condition, we're not covering you. That's the balance to the individual mandate. We have to have everybody in the pool so that you can't just wait till you're sick and then show up, otherwise the cost would go through. Um, there'll be standard insurance documents. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to read your policy. I have a PhD, I can't do it. Um, it's impossible, and it's not surprising that people get, you know, buy insurance that ends up not being what they needed, what they should have gotten. Um, and there'll be community rating. They won't be able to charge women more anymore. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> They will be able, there'll be limits on how much they can charge by age. They'll be able to charge you more if, you use, if you're um, a smoker. Um, but they won't be able to, to charge you more in all the tiny little ways that they have before. Um, so let's through. I wouldn't ask what it means for providers. Um, some of you will want to know that. Two million fewer uninsured in America. Oh, so everybody below 138% of the poverty level will be eligible for Medicaid. Right now, for an individual, that's 15,000, a massive sum of $15,415 a year in income. Um, $31,809 for a family of four. You will get Medicaid, which is um, free, free, free coverage. Above that, up to 400% of poverty, you will get um, subsidies to buy in this exchange. That's up to, now we're getting into a more you know, decent category, 44680 for an individual, and up to $92,200 for a family of four. It's not a huge subsidy if you're making 92000 but you'll get some help buying insurance. Um, there are subsidies for small businesses, employer mandates. Um, as we've heard, uh, employers over 50 will have to buy coverage for their, for their um, workers, or they'll have to pay a penalty. Um, and now the, the sexy part. It, it, it is actually a little bit about the individual mandate. Um, citizens and legal residents over the tax filing level um, have to buy coverage. They have to get coverage somehow. There'll be a tax penalty of between six, seven hundred and two thousand dollars for the family per year. That's still less than it would cost you to buy insurance. So if you're just making an economic decision, you'd still stay uninsured. And there are plenty of exemptions. It's implemented between a withhold on tax refunds. It will never be enough. As a consumer advocate, I'm very ambivalent about the individual mandate because it would never be enough to get everybody covered. We require that um, that if you want to drive a car, you have to have uh, car insurance. You know how many are uninsured? 12%. That's more than the number of people who don't have insurance in Connecticut, who have health insurance in Connecticut. And there's a law for that. We're going to have to do a lot more to make sure that it's something worth buying, that's worth more to you than to not pay the penalty to actually buy this. We're going to have to make sure it's something that covers when you need it, that it's you know easy to buy, that it's not a nightmare to buy. We have to, and we also have to do a really good patient education campaign because insurance, for a lot of my clients, um, insurance has been so crappy that it's actually the rational decision to put your money under a mattress and not buy coverage because it's going to cover you with things you never want to have or to protect an asset that you may not own your home. So it's not been a rational decision. We have to make it something of value and then we have to talk to people in buying it anyway, with or without the mandate. Um, talk a bit about the insurance changes. Uh, yeah, they can only base your rate on your age, tobacco use, and geography. They can't use gender and they can't use health status. The fact that you've been sick before doesn't mean that they can charge you. Pay. It's sort of the whole point of insurance. Um, I talk about exchanges. Yeah. Um, 
Medicare, as I said, oh, the great thing is another thing they've done to the scarce the Affordable Care Act is talking about how it's going to cost them more. That donut hole where they get coverage for uh, prescriptions, um, you know, from zero up to a certain level, they have to pay premiums every month. And then over a certain level, they um, stop getting any coverage. But you're still paying premiums every month, but you're paying for your drugs completely. That, and then they start paying again at a very high level. That donut hole is going to go away by 2020. People will get coverage all the way. Um, it ends overpayments to managed care plans and Medicare. We're overpaying them by 14%. I don't know why you'd pay extra to a managed care plan just to say no to things. It just didn't make a lot of sense. So that's one of the big ways they're using to fund the Affordable Care Act is to stop overpaying them. Um, it has a lot of initiatives. This is um, probably, let's say, a, a, a hefty chunk, maybe a third to even a half of that 900 pages is all about quality and delivery reforms. Pretty much any good idea that's worked anywhere has a pilot program. That's one thing people um, criticize the uh, Affordable Care Act because it doesn't do enough to improve quality and reduce costs. Well, part of the problem is we don't know exactly what improves quality and reduce us beyond what we've already done. We took the long, low-hanging well fruit already. We need to test things out. Things should be pilots. We shouldn't just say, this is a good idea, let's do it to everybody. Because sometimes it's not a good idea once you put it in place. So the Affordable Care Act in many ways is just a starting place to see where we need to go. This idea worked, great, we're gonna expand that. This one, not so much, we thought it would. It was a good idea, it didn't work, we were not. Um, I certainly don't wanna speak for purpose, but, um, some of the concerns that have been raised from the right are it is a government takeover of healthcare. I wish it was. It's not, unfortunately. It is um, a subsidy for, of the private system, insurance-based system that we already have right now. Um, limits on profits will hinder innovation. Uh, that there's not enough cost control in the bill, which is absolutely true. The individual mandate, um, that it costs too much, but in fact it actually saves money for the um, federal government to save money for families. And there's too little flexibility for states. Um, concerns from the left, uh, that the insurance and drug industry wrote the bill. There were a lot of deals made with the um, insurance and drug industries, a lot of industries in the bill. Um, and uh, you know, there was a feeling among liberals that, that, wasn't, that this was not a you know, the support industry bill. This was supposed to be a health care. Um, there's no public option. Do you all know what the public option debate was about? This is, I had to take this out. I was actually giving a talk um, a little while ago and Chris Murphy was on the panel and I had my public option slide came up and that was something he wanted very badly in the bill. And, um, and he just turned to me and said, Ellen, get over it. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, you and your colleagues are responsible for it. Um, but um, the public option was an idea of we're going to send everybody out and you're going to have to buy insurance from these private insurance companies, um, many of whom are for profit. And I worry about that, whether, you're, whether government's going to be strong enough to regulate that to make sure that it's something worth buying. What we wanted was a public option, just an option. Don't buy it if you don't like it. But have one insurance option, one coverage option that was um, transparent, run by government, and you could see how much it cost, it would be comprehensive, it would be affordable. If you didn't like it, you would buy it, it would die. Good competition, but they put that, apparently that was even too scary, so they didn't do it. There was no discussion of single payer. Um, they were not allowed to have a hearing on single payer. Um, this also is not universal. There will still be a lot of people left without insurance after this bill is implemented. Um, subsidies are too weak to be meaningful. Unfortunately, they are not, the subsidies all come up to levels that they did in Massachusetts for people. And um, affordability is a, is a squishy idea, but from talking to families and talking about what kinds of subsidies and what kind of costs they're gonna have, for a lot of people, it's still a lot of money. Um, there's too much reliance on states. Um, states are not completely equipped to handle implementing all the different pieces of this. And, um, and also, why should your, some states are choosing not to implement a health insurance exchange that rely on the federal one. Some states are, um, you know, we have uh, expanded our Medicaid program beyond others, and we offer a lot of options, like we offer on the wealth options services, 
other states don't. Why should your rights as an American be different if you live in Connecticut than they than they are if you live in Kansas? Um, and so that's one of the problems that the left has with it. And it also completely leaves out undocumented immigrants. There are between 80 and 100,000 people in Connecticut who are undocumented. They can't even buy in the exchange Um, so that's sort of the, the nutshell. I see a lot of glazed eyes, but honest, I give like a well, semester-long course on this kind of um, But that's the quick nutshell on the Affordable Care Act. Public opinion is very divided. It's very partisan, along partisan lines. Um, four in ten Americans will already believe the Supreme Court already overturned it um, because of all the all the news about it. Um, Six and ten want policymakers to keep working toward a solution if it's overturned, and that's a majority in all parties. And 59% um, admit that they don't have enough information to even offer an opinion on the Affordable Care Act. Um, oh, 36% believe that death penalties are in bill. How many of you believe that? Well, nobody's going to put their hand up now. I said that, right? But um, <laughs> they really do believe. That, um, there, that the bill allows a government panel to make end-of-life decisions about care for people on Medicare. That's not true. Um, over half think we got the public option, so we think it's almost the same thing as it does in the right? Um, and half of Americans are very confused about the bill. Um, part of, uh, and the, the, that was spoken to earlier, part of it is that as people find out about the provisions of the bill, they start to like, oh, I like that part. Oh, I like that part when they hear about it. Um, tax credits for small businesses. Um, people didn't know that that's in the bill, but they like it. Um, requiring easy to understand plan summaries. They didn't know it was in the bill, but they like um, health plan decision appeals. You can appeal if your health plan says, no, we're not going to cover that drug for you. People like that. They didn't know that was in there. Um, no cost sharing for preventive services. You know how, you know, people like me and your mother and your doctor are always, you know, complaining that you should go and get preventive care, and it's like, why should I go to the doctor when I'm not sick? They take away at least the copay. At least that's not a barrier. Um, and a medical loss ratio, which is basically requiring that plans can't spend more than 50 to 20 percent of the money that they get from you on administration and profits. You know, most of healthcare costs should go to healthcare, um, and people will hear that and they like it. So as people learn more about it, they like it more. Um, oh yeah, we did a, um, a survey of, um, of thought leaders in Connecticut just to see how Connecticut's doing. We also have a dashboard on our website um, of how Connecticut's doing. We're about 10.8% of the way to um, implementing reform in the state. If you look down the list of things for the to-do list for Connecticut. Um, and that sounds not so bad, given that it's mostly implemented January 1st of 2014. The problem is that the race has been going, it'll take 48 years before we get there. So we need to really bump it up in Connecticut. Um, thought leaders, state, stakeholders, people on boards and commissions, not people in government, but people outside, um, have, uh, we've done a regular survey in the last two months, we'll be doing it again soon, asking them how they feel Connecticut's doing. And we're up to a seat. I'm actually thinking we need to do a whole lot better if we're going to get this done. It's 900 pages and 600 of, um, of regulations just on the exchange that just came out. So, um, and you can go to cthealthreform.org if uh, that wasn't enough to get your eyes open. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll just move right along to Mr. Cullen. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try and take a little bit of a different approach in terms of trying to be a little provocative and asking you to think about this issue in a little bit different way. Let me start by saying that Dr. Andrews is much more competent in government than I am. I'm, my name is Fergus Cullen. I lead a group called the Yankee Institute, which is a free market oriented think tank here in Connecticut. And let me start by saying that I'm not a conservative who thinks that the conservative position on health care should be don't get hurt and don't get sick. Okay, for the Republicans, if you will, in Congress, Dr. Brown gave a very good synopsis there. 
uh, in 1994 made a terrible mistake. They rallied to defeat Hillary Care. They succeeded in that, took over Congress, and then they walked away from the issue. And meanwhile, people had, if you will, the audacity to continue getting hurt and continue to get sick and to continue to need health care in their lives. And they missed a huge opportunity, which gave uh, the left another opportunity to resurface the issue in the last couple of years. Now, I would like you, sir, to please do 20 jumping jacks for me. Would you do that? Oh, you don't like being compelled to do something. It's a fundamental reservation that a lot of folks have about government when it says that you must do something. So a government that can compel you to purchase health care may not stop there. They may compel you to buy broccoli. They can, it may compel you to join gyms. And they may even have some bureaucrat whose job it is to make sure that you're engaging in healthy behavior. Again, I mention this because I come to this issue with a skepticism about government and, if you will, a respect for what I see as the limits of government. Somebody like me sees floods in New Orleans and sees limits to what government can and cannot do to prevent disasters and keep us all safe. Somebody like me sees an oil spill in the Gulf and sees the limits of putting all of our faith in the right bureaucrats and the right regulators to make sure that nothing can ever go wrong. Somebody like me hears about a scandal involving Secret Service agents and sees the limits to human behavior. And fundamentally, I would rather put my trust and confidence in individuals to make the right decisions affecting their own lives than to turn over that responsibility to government. So that's the perspective I come to this. Now, I was at the United States Supreme Court a year ago. I was a bit player in a case involving taxpayer-funded political campaigns. And I had to show up at 5.30 to get a ticket. I just want to mention this because it's really cool to be inside the United States Supreme Court. The building itself, the courtroom, is about as big as the area where you are seated and we are seated. That is to say it's about half the size of a basketball court. It is small. And at precisely 10 o'clock, a voice booms, the voice of God from the heavens, and says, Oyez, Oyez, Oyez. And a curtain opens, and there are the nine justices. And they put their robes on, one arm at a time, like you would sweatshirt. And they are very practical-minded people. And they ask practical questions, and it's very accessible. We won our case there, by the way. Getting a case to the United States Supreme Court, they accept about 2% of cases that are appealed to it. We got to go there. So I was imagining that as I listened to this unprecedented six hours of hearings recently. And I want to ask you this. Who here can tell me why were we in court last month on this issue? Who can say why? Good answer. Now, who was the they that was challenging the constitutionality of the individual man? The they was uh, the Republican, I guess, or conservative. I told you. <laughs> State attorney generals, mostly conservative, mostly Republican, from 26 different states. And they were challenging Obamacare because of the expansion of Medicaid. Now, yes, they use constitutional arguments, and yes, a lot of conservatives like me are opposed to this on philosophical grounds. But fundamentally, because it expands Medicaid, Obamacare is, considered, is viewed as a moral threat to state budgets because Medicaid is a federal and state program. Now, Dr. Andrews talked a lot today about subsidies, and this is going to get taken care of, and you get that here, you don't have to pay the copay. Well, somebody is going to pay for that. And because it is a federal and state program, it is going to be you as taxpayers who pay for it. And not only are you going to pay for it in terms of higher taxes, but in other ways, higher unemployment, lower growth. And these are some of the concerns that people like me have about the bill, and that is why they were important. If the feds had paid for the whole thing, probably a bunch of those states wouldn't have felt compelled to go to court. They would have been if I will, if I can say, bought off in the process. Dr. Andrews talked about a lot of the industry players who were bought off in the process as a concern of hers. Well, that's politics and that's the reality of sometimes how things go. Now, I want to say something that is designed to be a little bit provocative here, because again, I'm challenging you to try and think about this issue a little bit differently. I believe 
that is a strategic goal of the left, to get as many people as possible dependent on, involved in, hooked on, some kind of government program. And that, that is part of the philosophy of the left behind uh, Obamacare as we came to know it. Now, uh, fundamentally, and I mentioned this before, the left believes that the average American, the average citizen, the average person in this country does not know enough, is not smart enough to make good decisions affecting their own lives, their own businesses, their own families. And so we need the right bureaucrats from the right schools to make these decisions on their behalf. And I think that is fundamentally part of how the left approaches issues like this. Now let me ask you this, how many here, there's often this sprayed in this language, do you see health care as a right or do you see health care as a privilege? Who here sees health care as a right? I show you. Who here would consider it a privilege? An option? Well, neither would I. I would call it a commodity. Yeah, health care is a commodity. But it's a different kind of commodity than other goods and services that you would provide, that you might purchase. Because you don't tend to shop for it. If you need an emergency appendicitis, okay? You don't say, how much do you charge, Doc? And so that's a fundamental difference in terms of this. But if you think of it not as a right or a privilege, but as a commodity, then we ought to perhaps purchase it similar, more similarly, to how we purchase other goods and services. Now, I would suggest to you that in most cases in this country, what we do not have is, a, is health insurance, but rather prepaid health care uh, in some ways. Through, and, and I want you to think about this in terms of, uh, of giving gifts. Okay? You get the most, think about this when you're giving a present or you're giving a present. Okay, you're buying something for yourself. You've got to, you know, friends ask you, what would you like for your birthday? I would suggest that you get the most value when you're using your own money to purchase something that you decide that you want. Okay? Who here has gotten that sweater from Aunt Edna that Aunt Edna spent $50 on, but you wouldn't have valued it at $50? Now you're polite, and you say, thank you, Aunt Edna, I love the sweat. But in your head, you're thinking, I wish I could exchange it, okay? I might have paid $10 for this, okay? So my point is that you get the most utility when you use your own money to purchase something that you know you want. You get less utility when somebody else uses their own money to buy something they think you want. And you get the least utility, the least value, when somebody else uses somebody else's money to buy something for somebody that they don't know. And that is how government supplied healthcare works. So when somebody else is paying for it and not you, you're going to use more of it and it's going to cost more. And when that is paid, picked up by taxpayers, it means we are all going to get more healthcare that is more expensive. So I, just, I challenge you to do this the next time you need healthcare of any kind. Minor, major, just regular checkup. Pause and ask the healthcare provider, hey, by the way, how much does this cost? Hey, we're gonna do an x-ray on your arm. You know, we're at the dentist, we're gonna do, it's time for an x-ray of your, of your jaw. By the way, how much is this actually gonna cost? I would almost guarantee you that they have no idea. The person providing that care to you has no idea how much it costs. Imagine if you purchased cars this way. You know, go on to the lot, I think it's time for a new car. Well, says the salesman, I'm glad you came here. And you go and you look at cars and you drive off with one and no one ever talked about how much it was going to cost. I know I saw a hand up, but I want to make a couple more points before we get into Q&A. So I do think that Dr. Andrews raises a point about the providers and the insurance companies. And I think they have a fundamental decision that they need to make. If you are Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, major healthcare provider, you need to decide, they need to decide as an industry whether they want to be private sector companies or whether they want to be treated like any other kind of utility, like Fox utility, like your electric utility, like NU, any of those, where they have a guaranteed level of profit and a guaranteed level of rate of return and they're happy with that. Or whether they want to be businesses that are trying to weigh costs and benefits all the time. Um, I want to, uh, 
Uh, and I want to put, I know we want to sort of get also into a little bit of the, some of the, the ethics, if you will, of this. And so I, I want to, uh, to put a scenario to you involving a real individual that I know you've all heard of. One of the sort of sad codas, if you will, of the 2008 election is that President Obama's grandmother, you may recall, passed away on the weekend before the election. This was the woman who largely helped raise the president as a young man and as a boy. And she never got to see her grandson actually get elected president of the United States. That's sad. Now, she passed away after a period of declining health during which she had received a hip transplant in that process, an artificial hip. She was in her 70s, and while I don't know this, I believe that she was probably on Medicare. Hip transplants cost something in the order of about $40,000, dollars all in. And she also had previously been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Didn't know how long she was going to live. They did the hip transplant. She was not expected to pass away soon, but she was elderly. She was not in the world's best health. And the surgery triggered a period of accelerated decline, and she passed away four or five months later. Now, I mention this to you because if we're ever going to control costs in a taxpayer-funded public system, then somebody's going to have to make that value judgment about does this person's grandmother get the hip transplant or not. And if you're not prepared to have somebody, a system, private or public, make that kind of choice for your grandmother, then you have to say, I guess we're just going to spend and spend and spend because I don't want to have to tell her. So I put that out there trying again to ask you to think about some of these issues from a different perspective and to be a little bit provocative. With that, I will pause and perhaps catch more of a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I do want to. I don't know how much time we have, maybe 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. But I do want to open the event up to questions and comments. So I will walk up to anyone who's willing to ask a question, starting with you. Um, I'm just interested because um, Mr. Cullen, obviously, you stand on the side of the Republicans, um, since you did label it quite clearly left and right, which I believe the world is not black and white. And I think that there's many shades of gray between. Uh, no illusion no in the 50 shades of gray. But anyways, um, you say that health care is an infringement on our civil liberties because it's forcing us to pay for something that may, maybe everyone doesn't find necessary. But the Republican stance is also supportive of a small government with a large military, which seems entirely contradictory since the military can be the greatest infringement on our civil liberties since they can decide at the drop of a dime when to tell us we have to go to an overseas war um, without our consent. So I just want you to under explain to me why you can support things like that, but at the same hand, don't want to support the health of our nation. I mean, I'm a college student, and the only way I got insurance is from visiting a community health center, um, which put me on a sliding scale that I paid $45 to visit. Otherwise, I would have been uninsured because I make $13,000 a year, which is over the Medicaid um, government. I'm just curious, you know, it just it seems like a contradiction. And very briefly, my first comment was saying I'm not one of those conservatives who say that the right position should be you cannot get hurt, you cannot get sick. Okay, I believe that having people who are uninsured is a problem. The question is, are there other ways to address that issue without a dramatic expansion in the size and scope of government in a way that we as taxpayers probably cannot afford? So I'm, I'm, uh, the uninsured issue is a very serious issue, uh, but there are other solutions to that. Uh, you know, uh, right now, uh, strip down, it's very difficult to get a strip down policy. As a young single person, perhaps without any other dependents, it's virtually impossible. Yet there is a private sector out there that would like to supply those kinds of, you know, high deductible, catastrophic plans. And there's a market, young, young single healthy people primarily, who would be very interested in purchasing them. You know, when I was, uh, I was uninsured by choice, right up until basically I got married. Uh, because, you know, I was a young, healthy, single person, and it was an economic decision, right? And I'm sure many of the people yeah. in this room have made that same choice. 
Um, and I recognize that you're, you're assuming that you are going to cross the street and get hit by a bus. Because you know that if that were to happen, you're going to go to Yukon and they're going to take care of you. And you probably aren't going to have to pay for it. Uh, but of course, we as a society do, and people who have insurance pay for it. But you know, that is a private sector, market-based way to address a very real issue. I think that's a non sequitur. I, I mean, we are all talking about making budget decisions. The Medicaid issue, Medicaid is the single largest line item in the state of Connecticut's budget. About $4 billion out of about a $20 billion program. Okay? So this is not this is not a little program. This is the single largest item in almost every state budget. And that's why 26 states were in court last week. Uh, yeah, Medicaid is so big because it's the biggest health care program in the state by far. It covers about 600,000 people. It's going to get another 130,000. So the reason it's expensive is because it covers a lot of people. But if you look at the per person cost, it's far cheaper than covering people on private insurance. And it delivers more in, in benefits at a lower cost to consumers. It's a really efficient program. Now, part of that is providers. There are other issues with it. Um, the other issue with those high deductible plans, at first when they came out, they sounded like not a bad idea. Um, the problem is it doesn't cover getting preventive care. Some of them do, but many don't. So it doesn't encourage you to, to do the things you need to so you don't have that $10,000 bill. You know, you don't get those chronic diseases. Um, and so we need to build insurance that gets people well, that keeps them well, not that takes care of them when the work happens. The other issue is that I have a lot of clients who don't own homes. They have cars that are worth less than the deductible. So as soon as they got up to a point in their lower income, as soon as they get up to where they have $2,000 worth of insurance, they would qualify for a public program. Public program. So they're essentially wasting money. Just a quick one, and I think you <clears throat> might have answered it. What does it cost the taxpayer today in this country for emergency room care, which everybody can get, as compared to going to a doctor? Sure, and again, I mean, I'm not arguing, I'm not defending the status quo. I'm not here to do that. Uh, but there are other ways to address this, including making you know, higher deductible health plans. And fundamentally, this idea that the government doesn't trust you to get your own preventative care. So they're going to come up with a system that's going to compel you to. I mean, some people may be comfortable with that. But I asked if you wanted to do jumping jacks, and you said no. Sir, that's preventative care. Any other questions or comments? We have a few. I'm just going to work this way. Um, I take issue with your with your comment. I think I'm a little misinformed about what you were calling the death panels or you were alluding to. As a healthcare provider, I see things that you don't see. People come into the emergency room with chest pains. They don't have insurance. They're sent home to die. So that decision is made for them by not having insurance. So it's so you're. you're I'm hearing you saying that the government is out there going to make the decision whether you get care or not. The lack of insurance is making the decision as to whether you get care or not. Just very briefly, I'm acknowledging that having uninsured people is an issue. The question is how do we solve that? Okay, let's, I saw Doreen stand up, so. Um. We heard Robert, um, Professor Brown speak about how history has shown that uh, at times of economic crises like our country is facing right now, and the nation is facing our state itself, uh, that it does take big government, it does take uh, action on the part of the government to step in and to play a progressive role as to instituting these programs. You know, if it wasn't for Theodore Roosevelt and it wasn't for the progressive thinking of FDR, we wouldn't have the Medicaid program that we have today. So if we continue to say, okay, somebody's got to come up with something better to think about and continue to waste our time, let's grab something now 
and put a band-aid in it, if, if so, so to speak, as, as opposed to not doing anything and continue on this down spiral of bad health care, of no health care, and no advantages. You know, no, nobody benefits from not having anything at all. Incidentally, I, I, I related to that, uh, how many people in this country are uninsured now? I've heard so many different numbers floated about 50 million, 47 million, 30 million. Do we have data on that? In Connecticut. It's bigger than, I believe it's Hartford, Bridgeport, and New London, all the entire population. Just, to, just on that point again, there are, it doesn't have to be government. Steve Jobs built Apple without government. Bill Gates built Microsoft without government. The railroads 150 years ago were built without government. Okay, if you think that the only government can achieve things, that, that is a point of view. I understand it. It's not one that I share. Let me, let me jump in here with that. Go ahead, Bob. Um, first of all, they were subsidized the railroads, right? First of all, I, 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 will have to, I will have to say this. I am, as, as far as uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, I'm on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 51% in favor of it. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I'm 51% against it. And on Sunday, I don't think about it at all. It's just a day of rest after all. Yeah, it's a remarkably complicated thing. But I will say, you know, people get to have it. The American economy was built on government. It simply was. It, it was. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. The railroads would not have been able to link the nation if the territories in the West, which were controlled by the U.S. government, if the Congress did not, if the Senate did not give them land, land grants to build railroads, and land grants on either side so you could build towns you know, on either side. So yeah, we have to get down to the fundamental costs. And I usually do think that a lot of the mind government there somewhere. Um, a. Ross Perot, the great free market uh, computer, computer guy before Bill Gates and uh, Stephen Jobs, um, he built his business on government subsidies. Yes, this is such a vast subject that you could have a workshop, an all-day workshop. I'm sure you realize that. The program is far greater than just the Affordable Care Plan. We feel entitled in this country, and we do need to have a single-payer system. I got a call from a friend in London at the time this was an issue, and it had just been passed, and he said he wants me to tell all his friends not to believe the lies that we are being told. No one there is being neglected, if you have an emergency um, medical problem, they do see you, but there are many people who are constantly abusing the system, and that has to stop. We have our largest cost in medicine today with the elderly, because they just go on and on and on with repetitive treatment. Technology, if we had a way, we're so inefficient. If we use our technology, so that all the doctors would be able to zoom in on what that patient had, just pressing a little button, would know everything that patient had and would not duplicate. If they're afraid of malpractice. Malpractice insurance is six figures, and for an obstetrician, it's seven figures. So that has raised the cost. So it's a, it's a vast problem, and I don't think it can be covered just, or even, yeah, we, it's a long time. Very briefly, if you're in favor of single payer, move to Vermont because they're adopting single payer there right now, uh, Shumlin Care. And uh, so if you think that's, if that's the goal of that deal for you, you can always move your feet and move. Now, there are a variety of reasons. The system is very close to single payer. Um, it is far preferable on, um, for, for a variety of reasons to the system that, that's emerging now. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's, it's, it's better for the states, as, as Mr. Thompson said. I think it avoids constitutional issues because the U.S. government is not attempting to make anybody buy anything. I think it's a better system in a lot of ways. Uh, Dr. Andrews, I agree with you that you know I was in favor of the uh, public option, obviously, and I thought that the health care plan was starting to go down the drain once they eliminated it. I was wondering if, is, like, do you think that the, like the competitive nature of the business would then would just be out of control? Would like, could you, you know, within five years, could we save fifteen percent on our health insurance by switching to a different insurance company? Could I 
pay less because I don't get sick, because I stay healthy, because I have a gym membership? Do I do I pay less money? I would like to share an opinion. saying that people don't get neglected and since it was a lady up from the chair the personal story um i don't know how this is going to affect anybody in the room but do people do actually get neglected um my father immigrated here two years ago from a country that was let's say a third world country to come for a better future with a lot of hopes and at 56 years old, he was diagnosed with <clears throat> spinal stenosis. And he was sent away from the emergency room because he was uninsured. Legal, he was legal. He had all papers, everything. And had they intervened then, he would be able to walk today. I mean, later on, he was able to get some services only because he got Medicaid. And it was a year and a half later, which was already too late. So yes, people do get neglected. That's a, a myth that you can go into an emergency room and they have to treat you. All they have to do is keep you from bleeding to death. There is a, a federal law at TALA where they have to stabilize you in a life threatening situation. That's their only legal requirement. Now, oftentimes they do provide treatment, but it's not free. It's not even close to treatment. Then if you have gotten an emergency room bill, they start at, you know, hundreds of dollars and go up to thousands for very small issues. It's not a place you want to get regular care. It's not effective, it's not efficient if you wait for about eight hours. Okay, uh, can I ask a question just before we go? I know we're out of time, but uh, the argument that conservatives tend to make is the argument that, uh, uh, that Fergus just made, and that is that to compel someone, some would call it coerce people to purchase health care uh, is, is something that uh, Americans should resist. And the other thing is that the assumption underlying a lot of uh, what's in the health care law is based on the idea that the individual is not educated or doesn't know enough to make his or her own mind. So I'm just wondering how those very powerful arguments, in my opinion, would be challenged. What do you say to that? Uh, well, first of all, maybe I was uh, inviting here and it was a mistake. Because I'm not necessarily a big fan of the individual mandate. I don't think it's going to be enough. I also am, as a consumer advocate, very uncomfortable with the idea of making people buy something in a private market that may or may not ever be healthy. Um, having said that, uh, you know, channeling my husband, who is an economist, it's very hard to build a pool if people can come in and out of it whenever they want. If you only buy insurance when you when it's a good deal for you. Well, that's going to cost more and more to people who are in there because the only people signing up, insurance costs you $1,000 a month. You're not going to do it if you're only spending $300 a month. It's cheaper for you to stay out of it. But once you do need it and it's starting to cost $5,000 a month, you're going to come in. Well, those, like Berger said, those costs have to go somewhere. So economists argue that we have to have everybody in, that the healthy people help subsidize those of us who are unlucky enough and you never know when it's going to happen to you to subsidize that cost, and it's, it's a shared, it's civilization. It's all sharing for each other. Um, you know, we ensure each other's bad luck, right? Um, that's the concept behind it, so I, I, I'm deeply ambivalent to that being individual mandate. As far as making people do things, I don't think we should make people do things, um, because they're usually backwards. You know, my son is a little older now, but 
I mean, I raised kids, I get that. Make them do it if they're going to not do it. But we shouldn't at least put barriers in the way of people doing the things we want them to do. If we want people to get preventive care, we should do it. It's not, I don't know, not probably have to go ahead of us, but it's not fun if you don't want to do it. And, and charging someone to do it is just a really gum headed policy. So that's why I think, just as a practical matter, in making people healthier, and we're all healthier, we all get Medicare, and that saves me money because we're people in the end of the world cost a lot. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Last year, uh, last year, along with um, thousands of my fellow state employees, uh, we were approved on the second go through a uh, plan to spare jobs, uh, cut, the cost, cut, uh, cut government costs, we got union security, and made some concessions. One of them was a health care plan that, uh, that is frankly far more intrusive than it used to be. I got, a, I got a, an email last week from the, uh, my designated health care provider for the state that told me that I needed to make an appointment to get my teeth clean, and I needed to make an appointment to get a physical. That's a condition of the health care. Uh, of, of the concessions we make, and there's a certain direct care for the now, Did I like getting it? No. Did I resent being told it? Yeah. Am I going to be have cleaner teeth? Sure. Um, and is that worth uh, the um, the compulsion? I don't know, but I do know that it's a good thing for me to get my physical every year, and I probably would have. So, you know, it's not a matter of I don't know about myself. It's a matter of sometimes we forget. Mm -hmm. I have, to, I have to pay uh, extra some hundred dollars for the idea. Thank you very much to the panel, especially our invited guests.